uh, welcome today. We're, uh, I think we're in for a treat this morning. It's going to be a lot of fun and be fairly informative at the same time. Uh, sitting uh, furthest away from me is my friend, uh, West Michigan native Steve Madden. Uh, Steve Madden is Colonel of the Michigan State Police. Uh, he has per performed several assignments inside the Michigan State Police, including post commander uh, here uh, just north of Grand Rapids. And uh, Steve, we're very glad to have you here today. I know you rearranged your schedule to be here. Uh, Setting next to Colonel Madden is Representative Peter Hoekstra. Peter Hoekstra is uh, representative for Holland and the area surrounding Holland. Uh, sits on three committees, the Education Committee. Uh, and one of the reasons that we've gotten to know each other better is because he also sets, sits on the uh, House uh, Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, Congressman Hookstra is a graduate of Hope College and uh, that place in Ann Arbor uh, at the <laughs> University of Michigan, so, but we can get along. Uh, setting next to Congressman Hookstra is Mr. Dale Watson. Uh, Mr. Dale Watson uh, is a former executive director, deputy director at the FBI uh, in charge of the counterterrorism division. Mr. Watson worked uh, just about every major terrorist investigation in the United States or supervised it. Uh, over the last few years. He uh, was instrumental in briefing President Bush after the 9-11 attacks. Um, he is uh, a legend in law enforcement. We're very glad to have you here, Mr. Watson, and glad that you could rearrange your schedule to be at Grand Valley. And uh, for those of you who were able to attend last night, sitting uh, directly beside me is our honored guest, the Honorable William Webster. Mr. Webster has a distinguished service, uh, distinguished career of uh, public service, um, leaving the uh, federal judiciary um, because it was the right thing to do for his country, he believed, and, and people told him that, uh, stepping away to run the FBI and then stepping away to run the Central Intelligence Agency. Dedicated public servant, uh, recognized by several presidents, including our current president, who has him as uh, the assistant uh, uh, director for our Homeland Security Advisory Board. Judge Webster, it's really a pleasure to have you here uh, today, too, sir. Um, we are going to begin. Our, the theme of our conference is uh, the president and information. But given 911, we're going to move uh, away from the presidency at times today just to talk about uh, the nature of intelligence gathering, civil rights, and other issues that are, are burning in America. But Judge, I'd like to begin, if I could. Uh, you briefed President Reagan, uh, both as FBI director and CIA director. Um, if you were talking with President Bush, what are some of the things you might be uh, telling him today? Well, I, <clears throat> I have to say that, that I briefed his father more often than I did President Reagan, but we had uh, he started his morning with a brief by the CIA uh, and with his national security director and the vice president. Uh, and uh, today we would be trying to inform him in a, usually in a form of a, of a paper, uh, a bound volume called The President's Daily Brief about the most important current events that were taking place around the world. Also, the results of considerable an analysis as to trends and likelihood that we felt would be necessary for him in making value judgments. Not a policy paper, but an information paper. And about an hour ago, that uh, same meeting is taking place with uh, President, present President George Bush, only this time the director of the FBI as well as the director of Central Intelligence will be present at the table. Okay, well, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Watson, I know that uh, President Bush, our current President Bush, had you in the office frequently after 9-11. Uh, without going into to detail, could you just tell us, uh, without confidential detail, but uh, could you talk to us about the structure and the nature of those briefings? Uh, uh, briefly, uh, follow up with what Judge Webster said. Every morning there is a briefing. The initial phase of the briefing is with the director of the CIA, with the president and vice president if he's in town. If he's not, he's at a secure, undisclosed location. <laughs> Usually by uh, video camera, you have Condoleezza Rice, uh, Andy Card. Uh, those folks are in there with him. And, and the first part of it is certainly the agency's brief, uh, what the world conditions are, et cetera. Uh, then the second part of the brief, the director of the FBI, along with uh, Governor Ridge, is brought in and some other folks and uh, discuss 
how all that you know, impacts upon not only inside the United States uh, activities in law enforcement, but uh, the incorporation of information. I think the key since 9-11 is that shared briefing of information, particularly at the federal agencies and the level that it's uh, disseminated to. George Tenet made a conscious decision that parts of uh, the presidential daily briefing, which uh, Director Webster, uh, Judge Webster talked about, uh, is shared with uh, key people around the community, to include the FBI, the Attorney General. The Attorney General's in that meeting, I forgot to add him. Uh, and so that, that's a very positive thing, <laughs> and you hear a lot about information sharing, but what the federal government has, generally those individuals are there. I, I was up there when the director of the FBI was not there, and uh, it's a very open and honest discussion. The president's very engaged with it. If I could follow this up with just a quick story to lead into uh, the next question for, for really both of you. Uh, in the late 80s, I was part of an academic experience with uh, political science of scientists and historian, uh, we would go to criminal justice, history conferences, political science conferences, and we were talking about um, national security from terrorism, primarily port security and uh, entry security. Uh, the political scientist was a uh, longtime employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. Every evening after one of these conferences, he would take me aside and his prejudices would come out. He would start, John, you're always looking for perpetrators. You come from this world of law enforcement. Why don't you guys just go catch the bad guys and let us do intelligence? And then he would, uh, he would continue his rant, working his way up to the FBI, explaining that he never really understood the FBI, uh, that they should chase bad guys and, and not go after these terrorists or, or other uh, folks worthy of counterintelligence. Well, about uh, six months ago, that's kind of stayed with me. About six months ago, I was at JTN, the J Justice Television Network, down in Columbia. This fellow's walking past me. It stops and said, you were just on TV talking about terrorism, weren't you? Right? Yes, I was. Well, he was a ranking official in the Justice Department, a prosecutor. And he said, well, I work organized crime in a large city. And he said, you know something, you terrorist guys? You're always going around just gathering intelligence. You don't gather anything we can use in court. And he looked at me and said, you're ruining the FBI. Well, I figured I was equal opportunity because I had the CIA and the prosecutors <coughs> mad at me for destroying the FBI. But there's been a rivalry between the two agencies. Judge, you ran both agencies. Uh, Mr. Watson, you, you worked at this interface. What about this rivalry and, and what's being done uh, to overcome? Uh, what it, Attorney General Ashcroft is talking about a seamless interface. Are we going to see that? <clears throat> well, I don't know about seamless, <laughs> but we will see and are seeing effective interface today. Terrorism brings both components, intelligence and law enforcement, together. You can't uh, uh, deal with terrorism without using both and using both effectively. I think what you're talking about, John, is really uh, history. The early origins of uh, the CIA in 1946 and 47, after the war, uh, different kinds of people being recruited under different techniques, being brought in uh, under a series of directorate systems, an FBI that was entirely homogeneous. If you had, uh, if you were a lawyer, an art, a scientist, a law enforcement officer, you took the same training, you went to the same places, you agreed to do the same thing, where there were many, many cultural differences. Most of those have broken down because the recruiting system now, the CIA and the FBI, are recruiting from over 100 colleges and universities throughout the country. They are not take, the CIA is not coming all from Yale, and the FBI is not coming all from Fordham. It's a, it's a, it's a very rich base, and it's, having, it's showing its effect as they've begun to work together, shared analytical capabilities, surveillance capabilities. Uh, you can't say that the two uh, organizations have two essentially different missions. One is to enforce the law, the other is to gather intelligence. Uh, are not going to have differences in views and, and friendly rivalries, but they're working together now in ways that they have never worked at before, and I'm very pleased to see it. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Watson. Uh, yeah, briefly following up uh, on the discussion, uh, 1996, uh, there was a conscious <coughs> effort made to try to break down the barriers, and, and I'm only talking about the uh, counterterrorism field. Uh, what was decided at the uh, 
highest levels of the FBI and the CIA, that the FBI and CIA would share personnel. And I think that's a key to breaking down barriers and cultures. Uh, I was the first uh, senior FBI agent, we call them agents, the agency calls us officers and, and that sort of cultural difference, to go over and, and actually be the deputy chief of their counterterrorism center. That system will only work if it's driven from top down and it's not about personalities. And what happens is the more integration and the more infusion of people that you have at the two organizations, understanding the rights of American citizens and their feelings about the CIA operating inside the United States, uh, the better off we are. And uh, that's going on at a, at a good pace today and, and probably accelerated since 9-11. But the concept that uh, we didn't talk to each other, we wouldn't share information uh, on a large scale organizational basis is, is fairly not accurate reporting. We can do a lot better, the FBI can do a lot better, the agency can do a lot better. Our LEGAT program, overseas <coughs> programs have expanded from 14 to 44 and we hope to go up to 56. It's not to do what the CIA does overseas, that's not the role of the FBI. The role of the FBI overseas is a uh, collection of evidence and being able to prosecute and share information and actually to protect the uh, covert CIA officer who might obtain that evidence that might possibly end up in a trial back in the United States. So it's always better to have a law enforcement agency chain of custody. And one final point, John, is that don't lose sight of the fact that there's nothing wrong with criminal prosecution in terrorism cases. And that's an absolute piece of the prevention problem, and maybe I'll talk more about that later. Okay. John, if I can just <coughs> give you uh, the third or a third component of, of that question. Uh, I don't think Congress is buying it yet, all right, that the, uh, the rosy or you know the, the more positive message that is coming from the CIA and the FBI talking about how they have worked in the past uh, and how they are much more effective uh, today. Uh, the testimony that we have had in uh, the various oversight, uh, the joint commission or the joint uh, hearings between the House and Senate uh, intelligence committees, uh, I think that, that Congress believes that uh, there is still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. Uh, in, in changing the cultures at both the FBI and the CIA to, to get the effectiveness. And we believe, and as we've taken a look at uh, the steps that have taken pla place over the last number of years, uh, that many of these have been band-aids that have recognized that the problems existed but not, didn't necessarily fix the problem. The, the joint sharing of employees, uh, CIA employees working at the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and a whole series of steps, but, but that none of these have, uh, have successfully uh, broken down the barriers and created, and I, I agree with Judge Webster, we're not going to get to a seamless, uh, but uh, I think that uh, many members of Congress uh, today are believing that there, there needs to be uh, some significant attitude readjustment. We're not sure exactly how that's going to take place, but if we are going to be effective, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Could I follow up on yes, that sir. with two points? Uh, I mentioned history earlier, right. and Congress has a role in, in the history Congress uh, conducted many years ago in the, in the middle 1970s two important studies called the Church Committee Report and the Pike Committee Report. And those pretty much castigated uh, the intelligence agencies and the law enforcement agencies for, for not staying apart and instructing CIA to stay abroad and the FBI to stay at home and to do those different jobs. Now I think we all recognize with the events of 9-11 that that system has to be adjusted dramatically, and it has been adjusted dramatically, and it will take a while before we can really s feel that we have made the, the total permanent changes that will support uh, our defense against terrorism on our own homeland. Uh, the one thing that Congress could really do to help at this moment, as, the, as Congressman Hocha said, there are a lot of patch jobs going on, and one of them is in the FBI's information technology system, a, a computerized system of automated case management based on individual cases that's 12 years old. Those of you in the corporate uh, sector know that about three years is as long as you can go without totally overhauling your existing management system, electronic management system, and being able to mine information out of what you have. And I think it's a, a major handicap to sharing information that the FBI is struggling with this 12-year-old system 
with three patches called Trilogy mm -hmm. that doesn't really permit it to get the information that it needs out of its system in response to a given situation to help and share with CIA. And I think CIA has always had the money to do that, and they've done it uh, well, and they're, they're prepared to go on. I think we have to bring the FBI's capability up, and that's going to require considerable funding and encouragement by the Congress to get to that level. And if I can follow up on that, turn to you, Colonel Madden. Um, Congressman Hookstra mentioned organizational culture. Um, one of the things in law enforcement that we hear, well, we live it, we breathe it, it's what we're about in law enforcement, is individual rights, civil rights. Even the criminals that we arrest, we are protecting their rights at the same time. The intelligence mission, uh, one could argue, is the antithesis of that, that uh, we're looking for information. We'll talk a bit, too, about how information becomes intelligence before our, our conversation is over. But not just with the FBI, beginning with state and local officers, we are not really, from that aspect, uh, programmed to collect intelligence. Is it something we can do on the state and local level and going over to the FBI? Well, I think it can, John, but let me provide a historical perspective about what the state's responsibilities are as well. Um, it is not, by definition, a responsibility of state government to become involved in counterterrorism activities. That's a federal mandate, not a state mandate. But it is a mandate now, as of an executive order written by Governor John Engler, to name the director of the Michigan State Police as Michigan's Homeland Director. So we are players and partners in homeland security, not necessarily in counterterrorism activities. But having laid that foundation, about six years ago, through one of our divisions, the Emergency Management Division, we started a terrorism task force in Michigan, where we brought in the players from both federal, uh, state government, and local government to talk about what our perceptions were about how we would deal with what has now become a reality. I can remember very clearly being one of the members of that original committee and thinking that terrorism, as we appreciated at the state level, would never occur to the level that we have now come to realize based on 911. We never thought that would occur in our uh, nation, much less in our state. So by definition, we don't become involved in counterterrorism activities as the federal players do, but we are players in terms of protecting the homeland that we have here. So towards that end, uh, we have members of the department, Michigan State Police, who sit on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, more active on the southeastern part of Michigan than here on the western side of the state. We have 19 people that are involved to some degree or other uh, in various activities as well. What we are more attuned to is criminal intelligence as opposed to terrorism intelligence. So from a state perspective, what we have done and what we have continued to do is gather intelligence, which is not just information, but it is the, to use the cliche, the connecting of the dots. It's the analyzation of that information and to put meaning to it uh, by way of example. To have uh, an example where a tanker truck of fuel is stolen in one part of our state may happen, not routinely, but not infrequently either. But if we were to gather intelligence from our troopers and deputies and patrol people out on the street that stated we had three tankers stolen today in our state or somewhere in the Midwest, that becomes information. But with the analysts that we have on our criminal intelligence unit staff, we would connect the dots, rise that to a level of our, our uh, uh, intentions of doing something about it or calling people. That's really what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, intelligence as opposed to information. Do we have to protect the rights of our citizens? Absolutely. And uh, we need to do that at, at all costs. The question, though, does arise from a policy level perspective. When does the homeland security infringe upon, or when do rights uh, become uh, added as an expense to protect the homeland that we have, whether it's in the state or whether it's at the federal level? And what you have seen here in our state is some of the federal agencies using checkpoints at some of the major uh, thoroughfares between us and Canada down in the metropolitan area. Uh, we're not a participant in that, nor should we be, because that's a counterterrorism kind of activity, by definition, not something that the states would do. It's a discussional issue, it's a policy issue, and uh, we always lay the, table, lay the table with the fact that human rights are of importance at all times. Homeland security is also of importance. 
If I, if I could follow that up just a bit, and then I would like to channel us uh, to civil rights because that's obviously uh, a question that comes up in Homeland Security. But uh, the mission of state and local officers, um, if I could play devil's advocate for just a moment, saying that that is not a state and local responsibility, and it is a federal responsibility, and I think Attorney General Ashcroft talking about seamless interface, which that's, that's nice rhetoric. I, I, we've been on the street and know how FBI and ATF and Michigan State Police and local police react with one another. We're, we're trying to get better. But um, in, in looking at all that, quite frankly, the ATF, FBI, and the other federal alphabet soup agencies don't know the communities. Local police officers do. The, the alphabet soup agencies don't know who's moving in what community don't know the uh, particular makeup and the particular radical groups. The, the Joint Terrorism Task Force does, knows it better than anybody else, but they're targeting very small groups. It's the state and local officers, uh, I would argue, who would have that uh, intelligence ability. Um, I agree with what I'm you're saying. And so I try to make the distinction about whether it's a mandate by statute, and it is not at the state level, but we are players. Uh, soon we'll be starting an intelligence officers liaison program to reach out into the communities and try to gather that kind of information so that we can feed it to our federal partners. But by mandate, it is not a state constitutional responsibility that, that uh, we are uh, required to do. Are we players there? Absolutely. And uh, Dr. White is absolutely correct. The players that move around at the local level uh, from an all hazards approach are really in our communities. And those troopers and deputies and patrol people that are out on the street working in communities, knowing what is abnormal, uh, what to look out for, working with their citizens and community groups is really where information starts and intelligence uh, results uh, as a result of that. Thanks, Colonel Matt. Uh, Congressman, if I can shift over now a bit to civil rights, and I would encourage everybody to join in. Um, the um, Patriot Act was passed rapidly after 9-11. Um, two issues with this. One, in the history of nations, many times nations prepare to fight the war they just lost, uh, whether it's building a Maginot Line or uh, trying to refight Napoleonic Wars uh, in the style of Frederick the Great, because Frederick the Great did well. Uh, we're attacked a particular way on 9-1-1. Are we preparing to fight yesterday's war and yesterday's group? Uh, and a follow-up to that, the Patriot Act went through so quickly. Uh, several critics have said, we just took the Bill of Rights and sliced it through, sliced it up as we sent the Patriot Act through. Uh, you were there, you were part of the debates. Uh, what's your feeling on both of those issues? Well, I hope we didn't uh, fight uh, or prepare to fight the last war. Uh, that's uh, obviously not the intent and not what we're trying to do. Uh, I think what uh, what we are hoping that we did with the Patriot Act is what we is what we did is we took uh, existing legal precedent uh, and applied it to new technology. Uh, you know, the the best example is there. There's a process whereby uh, law enforcement can get uh, the authorization to do surve surveillance on U.S. citizens, uh, wiretaps, and those types of things. And the uh, the technology has has evolved so far that. Uh, it was very difficult for law enforcement to apply current legal precedent uh, and legal procedure to cell phones and, and a whole series of new things that evolved from a technological front. Uh, and so what the Patriot Act, Patriot Act was intended to do was to not to change the civil rights uh, of U.S. citizens, uh, but to extend uh, the legal precedent that had worked relatively well for the old technology and take that precedent and apply it to uh, to the new uh, new technology. And so no erosion, just applying to this set of, of standards that we have become very, very comfortable with and that we thought worked well and protected individual rights uh, as well as provided law enforcement with the, with the means that they needed uh, that, that was necessary for them and, and to, to move it forward. And uh, that is what we have tried to do with, uh, with the Patriot Act. What was the second part? Well, I think you've got both yesterday's war and and civil civil well, rights. You know, the, the, uh, well, you talked about you know the uh, the erosion of civil rights. I can tell you that um, there is a uh, 
a huge concern in Congress about that. I mean, that was a, 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 key, to part, a key part of the debate. Uh, Congress's responsibility now moving forward, uh, we will do oversight on the effectiveness of the Patriot Act, uh, how law enforcement is using it, how it's working through the courts, are we getting the information that we need, uh, has it gone too far in certain areas that we are ero eroding civil rights, uh, and if, if that determination is made, uh, there will be a couple of remedies to go through it. Uh, number one, uh, you know, we can't shred the Bill of Rights uh, with a legislative act. Uh, you know, it will be it will be tested in the courts uh, if if we have gone too far, uh, and uh, if if we went too far, uh, hopefully the courts will step up and, and pull us back in. Uh, and the second thing that will happen is uh, is if if it is being used in ways different than what we anticipated, uh, Congress has and I think has the responsibility to go back and to and to adjust it. And I can tell you that, you know. Very seldom does Congress get anything right the first time. Uh, the, uh, very seldom do we get it right the second time or the third time. So one of, because you're in a very dynamic situation. You know, technology will evolve. Uh, we, we will think that we have gone through and we have dotted the I's and crossed the T's exactly right. Uh, and there will be some legal uh, mind out there that will, that will twist it and move it in a way that, that we never anticipated. Uh, and so uh, it is a constant process of, of taking an action, evaluating, uh, and then responding and moving forward again. One of the critics uh, that uh, I, I came across the last couple of weeks talked about that in terms of surveillance of private companies. Uh, let's just draw an analogy if I can ask you to, to explicate that just a bit more. If we have ABC manufacturing here in Grand Rapids, suddenly there's an act that says, okay, in ABC manufacturing, the government now has the right to come in and examine all your sales records in the name of national security. In effect, the Patriot Act says to service providers, on the, the inter internet service providers, the government has a right now to examine your records, your, your sales records, your use records, because national security might be involved. Will that Will such powers protect civil rights? And uh, I would open that up to you, Mr. Watson, and Judge Judge Webster also. Well, I think the uh, <coughs> exact you know, the uh, the exact process to go into ABC company or go into an internet, we just cannot go in uh, and say in national security. There is a process, uh, I believe, that it, that that has to be gone through. Uh, that we have to have the justification uh, to go in and access that information. Uh, and we, there has to be a compelling case, and there's probably some term for the legal standard uh, that has to be met uh, for uh, the federal government or a policing agency uh, to go in and have access to that kind of information. And that legal standard, I don't believe, was changed with the Patriot Act. That, that, that is correct. If I could just add to what the Congressman said. Uh, the Patriot Act uh, enhanced our ability to obtain information and share information in uh, two broad areas. And Congressman's exactly right. Changing technology, particularly in the cyber arena, with crimes moving rapidly toward uh, more cyber than than what we traditionally have seen in the past, I, I don't think there'll be too many crimes in the next five years that does not have some aspect of that. But the ability for the law enforcement to obtain information, just as the example you used, is, is limited. I mean, that we go before either it's a FISA court, and I don't want to get too technical here, or a criminal court where a federal judge reviews that. The FBI and Congress is exactly right. Doesn't have broad authority just because we don't like the way you look or we think you're involved in something to go out and grab your records. It's, it's controlled by the court. One final point that, uh, let me just put on this about <coughs> what, uh, you know, what direction is law enforcement in this country going? Uh, a good example is in the late 60s and early 70s, we were all aware of the number of plane hijackings inside the United States. It was almost a daily occurrence for a while. And what happened on that? Metal detectors were put in the Air Force. And I recall the New York Times running a large article in the press back in the 70s that said, this is an illegal search. This will never stand the test of time and through the court system. Well, it did. And it did, and it stopped the hijackings. And it stopped them because that's what the American public decided to put up with. So ultimately, it rests with you as to what you want the Congress to, 
to limit and what powers or, or what level of security you want. So that's a very, I mean, that's a very valid question. And, uh, and the one final thing on the Patriot Act, the most important thing was changing the requirements of the FISA, the uh, surveillance court on the intelligence side, from the primary purpose for the reason for you obtain this warrant to a significant uh, the FISA, okay. I'm sorry, Judge, I'm just for the audience, FISA is federal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I've got surveillance. too many acronyms. <laughs> Acron. Foreign it Intelligence Surveillance Act. Surveillance Act. Uh, it is uh, an intelligence gathering act which sets up a separate court to review search warrants uh, on intelligence matters. Title III under the Omnibus Crime Act deals with uh, gathering information for criminal prosecutions. and. People talk about FISA warrants and, and criminal warrants. I'm sorry, Judge. Please go ahead. Let me pick up on what Dale Watson had to say. And incidentally, the, a recent decision this week upholds uh, the the change that uh, by the Court of Appeals of the of the FISA Act upholds what Dale was talking about. But he reminded me when he's talking about uh, the metal detectors. Uh, I sat on the U.S. Court of Appeals in a case challenging the constitutionality of that, uh, and in my opinion. Uh, I said not only was it constitutional, but I believed at this stage in our experience the American people would be outraged if they took away pa that protection for passengers boarding airplanes. And I think that that again <coughs> reflects the public view. <coughs> and in addition, uh, as the congressman pointed out, the court, an independent judiciary, one, one of the great wonders and glories of our society, stands there ready to make that distinction when you have transgressed the Constitution. Many of the Patriot Act uh, uh, improvements were long overdue. Uh, it did not take into account modern technology. Uh, forget a, get a Title III wiretap. Uh, you had to focus on a particular telephone instead of a particular subject. No trouble at all to walk around with five cell phones and pick and choose and defeat law enforcement efforts. That's been corrected, as it should have been a long time ago. But knowing that every single requirement for probable cause is still in place and the courts are still there to judge the necessity, but they are simply adopting this to uh, modern requirements and modern challenges. This is one of the problems, I think, with trying to legislate too fast, as we had to do this time, but legislate uh, in so much detail without getting the experience. Uh, we're seeing the, the, uh, on the executive side of the House uh, rapid movement after 9-11, executive orders of one kind or another, most of them very good, but at, at least uh, in some cases one might say they had the appearance of ready fire aim without having been able to digest the consequences of what they were doing. One good example is the creation of military tribunals, which are really battlefield conditions to deal with what we would do with all of those people that were captured who were not in uniform, were not uh, pledged allegiance to a state, uh, engaging in various terrorist activities, and whether or not they'd be covered by the Geneva Convention, where all we could do was ask name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> when we desperately needed to know more about these people around the world planning to do us harm. So the original order was very broad, suggesting even that maybe the writ of habeas corpus had been suspended, no right of appeal. Uh, when it got to Secretary Rumsfeld's desk, he convened a number of us to sit down and look at the rules that he was directed to create for this. And I must say some of the great civil rights people were present at that meeting, watching out for our rights. And the rules that came down, I think, are so sound that no one could seriously argue that our civil rights were in danger because of the creation of military tribunals for battlefield conditions. And we haven't found it necessary to use them yet. So that's another good sign. It, if I can move into that area now. Um, Judge, you were, uh, you were in the midst of what was happening with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. During You're talking, this talking back, back in desert in the Cold War. Yes, sir. Yes, War. sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the Soviet-Afghan uh, war, and which eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, we've chatted about this a bit. Um, critics say that we completely misjudged the Mujahideen. Not we so. Have, oh, would you expand on that, <laughs> yeah. please? Not so. Uh, we always knew that 
in Afghanistan, these tribes were very tribal. They'd been, the country had been put together by a kind of act of the United Kingdom or whoever managed to make that distinction. Uh, we knew that they were tribal. They knew they didn't get along with each other. They knew they were constantly elbowing and shooting at each other. But we also knew they had one common objective which was in common with us, and that was to defeat the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And they worked very hard, and we worked very hard. We were not over there fighting with them, but we were supplying them with the logistic capabilities to be able to do that job. And I have said before, and I say again, I think that's one of the two great achievements driving the Soviets out of Afghanistan that weakened them at the end of the Cold War, the other being the Strategic Defense Initiative, which they could not afford to compete against. We knew that at the end of the war, there was never any doubt in our mind and our intelligence that they would go back to tribal rivalry. I met with them uh, a couple of times in uh, Peshawar in Pakistan on the edge of Afghanistan, uh, saw how they worked together for one common purpose only, and that's the removal of the Soviet Union. There was Gobatin, Hekmatar on the east, Massoud on the north, mm -hmm. scholarly uh, Rabini, the first president, uh, totally different types of people. Now, what I agree with you about is that we left them too soon. We should not, after the, uh, the, the Soviet government in Kabul had been overthrown, we pulled out. I was gone at the time, and I won't take credit for that decision, but we left too soon. We should have stayed behind to help them rebuild a central government, and we failed in that. And I hope that that lesson has not gone unheeded in what we're going to do about Afghanistan in the future, or we may have another situation such as we had uh, with the Al-Qaeda who moved in, the Taliban came in to fill in the, the gap, <coughs> provide roads and then uh, order, and then an obsessive uh, control over the civil rights of the people. I hope we will not make that mistake again. Well, Mr. Watson, I know that you worked uh, what I would call the Iranian desk and, and the FBI, and uh, you specialized there. Uh, following up on what Judge Webster has talked about, if, if we look at the, the term Islamic fundamentalism it, it is a misnomer in our media, but if we look at the theology of uh, Saeed Qub, of Maududi, of Khomeini, uh, and we see these uh, Islamicist movements, uh, political Islam, um, that brings us to a future of the Middle East, future of uh, Central Asia, and maybe Asia itself uh, uh, with uh, growing movements there. And in addition, it brings us to something that James Wolsey uh, predicted this summer, a second Iranian revolution, not by uh, the Khomeiniists or, or any members of the, the Brotherhood, but uh, a revolution of a middle class who doesn't believe that a theocracy can provide uh, basic governmental services to the population. What's your take on uh, this political revolutionary Islam? Uh, I, I see it uh, basically, uh, John, as, as a changing environment. And I, I go back to what uh, Judge Webster said, too. The importance of whether we ever get out of this business of fighting terrorism, be it in the Middle East or being in, in Southeast Asia, is contingent upon the fact that uh, problems that are going on in the Middle East, I'm, I'm not very optimistic that those issues will ever be resolved, or not in our lifetime. And uh, most people come out and, and say, well, how long are we going to be in this terrorism business with the fundamentalists, so, so to speak? If you go back and look and, and you come out with the conclusion that, one, a lot of smart people, and it's been going on for centuries, the problems in the Middle East. I'm not sure there's a quick fix for that. The problems in, uh, with the IRA, or the problems with the FARC down in Colombia, or the problems with the Tamil Tigers, and, and, and you look across the board, this is a phenomenon that will continue for, uh, for a long period of time. What I see happening is, if you accept that basic threat that that's going to be with us and that we're going to be attacked again, Americans are going to be attacked again, then that leaves you with the, what do you do? Do you throw up your hands and say, we can't do anything? Uh, do you spend all your money in the state government to uh, protect uh, every citizen in the state of Michigan? Or does the United States you know, do that? Uh, exactly where do you come out in the balance? And the only way to really look at it is look at where you're at in your capacity. 
And if you're running a business or if you're running a, a, a city government, you have to see this is what I can do, spend all the city's budget, or make some conscious business decision about raising your capacity. I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but uh, it goes back to uh, work in Afghanistan, work in the European countries that uh, uh, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union there, their ability to give hope to people and their ability to have a system so that individuals growing up have some type of hope. And that can be a strong judicial system so American companies can go in and, and enter in contracts that will be supported and won't run off. A good legislative uh, system uh, uh, that people have confidence in. And it's building the hope of the individuals that are wherever you're talking about. You can be talking about South America, you can be talking about Africa, you can be talking about the Middle East. It's that ability. And it's not necessarily a force issue all the time either. So that, that's a very key point, and I'm glad you made that, because once you, you know, if you had to extract people by force, you've got to have some system to be able to build hope and to build that government and that economy. And I really believe that. We're going to be having this problem for many, many years. Yeah, I, I, just building off of what Dale was talking about, you know, in January I had the opportunity to go to <coughs> Egypt, uh, Jordan, Syria, Israel, and also met with, uh, with Arafat. And trying to predict exactly what's going to happen over uh, in that part of the world is, uh, is almost impossible. Uh, what, what you do is you, you, you try to build the relationships that you can. We know that over uh, since September 11 uh, that <coughs> each of these countries uh, have been very helpful uh, in the war on terrorism, uh, much to the surprise of, uh, of many, uh, and a lot of it very, very low key. Uh, they, all have, uh, the, uh, they all have internal conflict within the country. They, they are willing to, to tolerate a, a level of uh, frustration, uh, hopelessness. You know, Dale talks about hope. Uh, when, <clears throat> when I was in Jerusalem, uh, the hotel that we stayed at, and this was January and it's only gotten worse, uh, the occupancy rate was 5%. So think about going into a hotel with, uh, you know, an occupancy rate of 5%. Uh, and my guess is that uh, since then it's probably gone down even more, uh, two or three percent. And uh, you go through, uh, you know, you go into the West Bank, you go to Ramallah, uh, you meet with, uh, you meet with Arafat, and you can't quite understand how, uh, after 50 years, the these people haven't tried to come to some type of an accommodation uh, and work out uh, the differences and. <clears throat> they just have a very different time orientation than what, than what we have. Uh, in the United States, with that kind of level of violence uh, or, or hopelessness, we'd say, let's solve this and let's solve it this year. Uh, you go to Syria and, and you drive up, and we went and we, when we met with Bashar and we went to his palace, you're overlooking the city of Damascus. And uh, he's got floor to ceiling uh, glass windows overlooking the city of Damascus. And he asks you, you know, or he states the longest continuously inhabited city in the world. Now the people in Cairo would debate that, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's how he's describing it. And he says, how long? And you're kind of thinking, I mean, let's see, it's, it's in the Bible. Uh, so you say three or 4,000 years, and it's, he says 7,000 years. Uh, and that's what, it, that's what their thinking is shaped around. And you know, we all live in a country that is you know, 225, 240 years old. And, uh, 200, you know, 50 years in their, uh, in their view of the world is not a very long time because uh, they put it in context of 70 or 7,000 years and uh, it, just, it just bewilders me that they are willing to put up with that level of violence day in, day out, year after year after year uh, without, you know, say, throwing up their hands and saying this is not going to work for our children. Uh, let's come together with, uh, with some type of a peace agreement. It's ironic because I have had uh, foreign uh, <coughs> academics and foreign police officers and sometimes foreign military folks ask me the same question about the United States. How can you tolerate that level of violence? How can you tolerate your murder rates and your crime rates without yeah. doing something <coughs> about it? Um, and that leads me to another point, but Colonel, you I, I saw your hand there. What, well, I yeah. wanted to piggyback a little bit what has been said previously. Given the fact that Dale's assumption 
is correct, or, or we may say that it's not going to be solved in our lifetime, then what we have to do as a society to protect our homeland is to identify the vulnerabilities. And then we have to realize the gap of the vulnerability and where we are and how much risk are we as a society willing to assume to protect that vulnerability. Are we willing to protect some of it, all of it, none of it? And what dollar cost are we going to associate with protecting that? That's sort of where we are at in this community, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America. What price are we willing to pay to protect that vulnerability? And what we are doing this past year now, more than ever before, certainly in the 30 years I've been in law enforcement, is to identify what those vulnerability, vulnerabilities are. What that has led to is great partnerships as we reach out beyond our horizons to look to the federal government, to look to business. 85% of America is privately owned. So we have to reach out into industry and business, into colleges and universities uh, to understand the importance that they all play in keeping this machine alive that we call the United States. Well, well let me, oh, uh, go just ahead. Just one quick follow-up on that, and I think, uh, Colonel, that's exactly right. But if you go back, the Israeli model's been talked about, and if you go back and look at uh, their record on prevention and what they spend on trying to prevent acts of terrorism, you get a pretty good balance here of as to what degree and what amounts of money the U.S public yourselves want to spend and what the criteria is. And I think that's a very valid argument that uh, it, it boils down to what are you comfortable with and what do you want spent on this problem. Well, and I know we're approaching this now from a security uh, vantage point. If I could shift just a bit, uh, taking off on what you've said earlier, I, I want to bring up two points. One, the nature of religious terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, we know that terrorists behave differently than regular criminals. They are, they are motivated, they're goal-oriented, they study, uh, they remain terrorist after you place them in jail. Religious terrorists differ from regular terrorists, where religious terrorists see death as a sacramental act. Religious terrorists are playing only for their deity, not to change political behavior. Religious terrorists become uh, more deadly. Religious terrorists introduce uh, suicide bombings and uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel, uh, and uh, with the advent of Hezbollah after 1982. Um, we've been talking about extremes. Is there a chance for dialogue and justice for moderates? Uh, if we need to rebuild, or as the judges suggest to talk about nation building, do we need to talk about uh, population building and ethnic building? There are Palestinians wandering around without hope, uh, and maybe our record, well, our record hasn't been as strong as it's been in other parts of the world. There are uh, people in Central Asia right now that we've embraced the other stands, Turkmenistan, uh, uh, Uzbekistan, and, and the other lands above there, with some very repressive governments, uh, all in the name of this war on terrorism. And I want to come back to war on terrorism, too. Is there a role for religion, for political moderation, and for what we like to think about the United States in terms of humanitarian aid? Is there a, is there a place for that in a struggle for security? Or have I just <laughs> given a sermon? <laughs> Congressman, take that one, will you? <laughs> the, the, uh, I'll take tackle part of it. Uh, is there a role for moderates? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, if you go, and I think one of the hopeful signs in you know, what we've seen the last uh, eight or nine months is, is the help that we are getting from Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in the war on terrorism. Uh, the second thing is that Jordan and Syria have uh, new leadership with, with King Abdullah <coughs> in Jordan and President Bashar uh, in Syria uh, that recognize uh, some of the threats, their internal threats, but also recognize and I think have a, a, greater, just a greater willingness to work with the United States uh, than, uh, than the previous regimes. You, uh, <coughs> you know, the, uh, I, think, I, I think it was quite surprising last week uh, with the UN Security Council to see Syria actually vote with us. Uh, I, uh, you know, I didn't get any briefings on that, but if you'd asked me before, I think mm -hmm. uh, the best that I would have expected from Syria is that they would have abstained from the vote. Uh, to actually get them to vote with us uh, on the resolution against Iraq uh, 
it, it, I think is a very positive sign. Uh, that, that indicates that they, they, are, they are willing to not only have a dialogue, but to work with us constructively to address uh, the problems in, in the Middle East. So uh, there, there is a, a real need for, uh, to have that dialogue w with those folks in the Middle East that, that, that are willing to, uh, to work with us. The second thing is, I, uh, the last trip that we had there, we, we spent some time with Margaret Tutwiler, our, our ambassador to uh, Morocco. And we do a miserable job uh, in so many places of marketing who we are. So you will have these religious extremists uh, going into the schools, uh, going into the communities, going into the cities, uh, defining who America is. And we don't do anything uh, to counteract that. You know, we, and one of the things that, uh, that Margaret was talking about, you know, is wouldn't it be great if, uh, if we had, you know, leading business people leading political leaders uh, from America come in to Morocco, go into some of these countries, uh, and present ourselves into the local communities, uh, to go into the schools, to go into the universities, uh, and present the image of, of who we think we are and what we have done for these countries, uh, so that to, to be a counterforce to how others are defining ourselves. If, if others are defining ourselves, if others are defining America, and we are not defining who we are, they then will have created the perception uh, in the minds of their populace who America is. And you know, my background is marketing, and, and part of this is a marketing, uh, is, is marketing warfare. Uh, and if, if we do not respond through the State Department uh, as to giving these people an idea as to who we are and what we stand for, uh, we will lose, we will lose because uh, at that point in time, the religious extremists will uh, have defined us uh, for, for those populations. If I can say, I think that's an extremely important point. Uh, the weakest point of part of our whole response to uh, the events of 9-11, in my view, has been the absence of, of an in-place public diplomacy around the world stating our positions, particularly in the Middle East. We had no one to stand up for us. For years, uh, hatred had been preached in these madras schools which were subsidized over there with nothing <coughs> to talk about the real people that we know we are the real people of america uh, we need to we need to spend and invest with our people and with our funds getting our story out and getting people out there who know us best to speak up for us to say we are a beacon of hope that we that our mission is peaceful and to rebut all of the hateful allegations that were been so effective in creating these terrorists that we know today. Yeah. I'll give you one small example that, that Margaret brought up. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge debate within uh, the Congress now that is beginning as to the role of USAID, uh, foreign assistance. And we provide billions of dollars uh, to a number of countries around the world. Much of that, much of that money gets spent on products, services, uh, and the people who receive them never know that it comes from the people of the United States. So we may buy beds for, for hospitals, uh, and we may provide food, and these folks will never know that it comes from the United States. And Margaret very simply said, you know, from now on, you know, if, we, if we're buying uh, equipment uh, for facilities uh, in Morocco, it's going out there and it's going out with, with a flag on it and it's provided by the people of the United States of America. Uh, just a, a very simple message that says, we are out here, we are, we are helping your population, we are helping you on an individual basis, uh, and this is coming from the people of the United States of America. And there are, I can tell you, as we went through it, it was one of the most fascinating discussions that we had. There were people in our State Department who are opposed to that policy. Opposed to, you know, there, we, uh, there, were, there were people in, in our State Department, and, and, you know, she went through it, she said that, you know, she was encouraging people within, within the embassies to go to the schools, uh, and she said there were people within uh, the embassy who were unwilling to go out and market the United States uh, in the country where they were serving. And perhaps one of the reasons may be, and a, and a point back to the, our, the stands, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, they are not known for having representative, uh, gentle, um, institutions, institutions that we say we cherish, and yet we're supporting them much like we did the national security states in Latin America in our battle with communism. Um, 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against the point that, that you and Judge Webster make. I agree with it wholeheartedly. But I'm saying it has to be more than marketing, that we, yeah. we have to export the val all the values we say we believe you, in. You've blown us away because yeah. we didn't even know there were that many stands out there. <laughs> and you know them all. I think you, threw, I think you made a couple of those out there. <laughs> yeah. John, that is a good point. And just a 30 second answer here. It's, it's a foreign policy issue that has to be addressed on a continuing basis. And I'm not into foreign policy, but how long do you support someone that we don't necessarily agree with or their system of, of laws and regulations? And I point back to the Iranian situation where we stuck with the Shah and, you know, is that a foreign policy issue? At some point you say, wait a minute here, you know, maybe we should do something else to encourage some other form of government. So those are hard, hard foreign policy issues, and I'm glad I don't have to address them. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, there are a couple of quick things I'd like to go through. We have used the war metaphor. The country is using the war metaphor. Uh, is that the right metaphor to use against terrorism, or is this uh, in the shadows? Is it law enforcement and intelligence? Uh, just some reactions. What would we say, John? We're concerned about terrorism. Uh, America talks in provocative terms, I think, and uh, it, it seems to fit the bill based on the generation that we have in front of us and the issues that we are addressing. I think it defines for us a sense of the importance of it. What I think we're besieged with is PMI, too much information most of the time. You can't turn on a cable station now where it's uh, alert on the, on the war all the time, all the time. So we, we become desensitized to that. I think what, what America has to, to do is maybe tone down the rhetoric a little bit because when the flag goes up, when the time happens, God forbid it does, then we have to be prepared and ready. But uh, we have to be careful about how provocative Americans are about these kinds of things, I think. Thanks, Errol. Other comments? Well, you've got, I mean, we've maybe overused the term war. We've got the war on drugs, we've got the war on crime, you know, we, we've, we, have, we have maybe uh, overused the, war, the term war. War on terrorism, uh, I think, is probably a valid uh, usage. I mean, the, uh, the ultimate goal and objective uh, of the terrorists is to change our way of life, if not to destroy it, uh, to have a significant incap impact economically, uh, politically, and militarily. And so uh, you put that together, and uh, I'm comfortable uh, referring to this as a war on terrorism. Well, thank you. Other comments? Really, we knew what the Cold War was by the time it was over. <laughs> and I hope we'll know this one uh, will end as successfully, whatever yeah. we call it. Yeah, maybe so. And I don't know what other term. Uh, the it is a war. Go ahead. I, I believe it is a war that we need to engage and, and uh, keep this on the forefront of the American public understanding that this is a long-term engagement. And maybe it's just the difference between Clausewitz and Sun Tzu. For, so for 200 years, we've been in the Clausewitzian paradigm, and it might be time to read Sun Tzu. Um, can I ask, uh, uh, before uh, we're going to ask the audience for questions, I know we're on a TV timetable too, but uh, can I ask, uh, what do you think the future holds? Uncertainty. I mean, I, this is a, uh, for a lot of us uh, going through this process, uh, you know, sp especially in the political arena, it is a, uh, it's a new day. Uh, you have to recognize that uh, much of the world, or much, much of the political world, uh, spends very little time on foreign affairs. Uh, and so this is a, uh, an accelerated learning curve uh, for those of us in uh, the political arena. We, uh, we have constituencies to deal with, and back home, uh, you know, historically the perspective has been if you're dealing with foreign affairs, uh, you haven't answered the key political question that many of our constituents ask us. What have you done for me lately? Uh, and doing something on foreign affairs is something that has not been high on, uh, on the radar screen. So it, it's, it's an accelerated learning curve. Uh, there is, uh, it is a different type of conflict. You know, you can't go back to a textbook and say, you know, the only thing that has changed is the technology that has changed, the, the very nature of the people that uh, that threaten us is, uh, is, uh, uh, is something that we haven't uh, encountered before. And it's, it's very difficult uh, from, for those of us uh, from, from, from a Western perspective to understand what drives uh, and what motivates and how to respond 
uh, to, uh, to many of these people. I was a child of the 50s and grew up uh, in drills in my elementary school where I had to hide under the desk because we knew during the Cold War period that the Russians were inevitably going to fly across Alaska and, and bomb us, if you recall back in those days. And so I grew up in an era of civil defense. And I felt uneasy as a child and a young adult doing that. But through my middle years, I was very comfortable uh, knowing that uh, while conflict was inevitable across uh, the globe, it, there's never been a globe without some kind of a conflict, I was confident in America being able to handle that. I now feel uncertain, as the Congressman has mentioned, about the future of uh, my children uh, who are married and living away from home and, and all the time that we have spent saving money so that we could retire. What's going to happen to that? Uh, what's on the horizon for us? Uh, is there a prognostication that is of a positive nature. So I think the congressman's term of uncertainty really sums it up for me in terms of where we are at, at this time. It seems to me that President George Bush uh, summed up the challenge uh, in the days following 9-11 when he went to the National Cathedral in the presence of all the leaders of our country prayed for patience and resolve in all that lies ahead, a recognition that much lay ahead of us and that we would need patience and resolve. Those qualities have stood us well in our past history. We picked ourselves up off the ground after Pearl Harbor, and we started out and we stayed with it until we had completed the job. I hope that that spirit of America is still alive and well. Uh, real quickly, I, I, I believe there's an uncertainty about the future. I think we continue to, uh, we'll have to address this issue, but keep in mind that uh, why we're vulnerable is what we all have come to love and enjoy. And that's our freedoms, our encouragement of immigration to this country, our expanding business world overseas, men and women of the United States business companies spread throughout the world, and as America is the target for that. And then. Lastly, and most important, what makes us vulnerable is our Constitution and our freedoms. And I, I continue to see a protection of the Constitution and continue to protect individual rights, which has made us great and which is what makes America the greatest country in the world. And I don't think anybody up here or anywhere back in Washington wants to alter that in one way, realizing that Americans also are, have a short memory and uh, want to get back to the, the way things have always been and that makes us also vulnerable. Thanks, thank you very, very much, Mr. Watson. We have, a, we have about 10 minutes for questions that have come up from the audience. Um, what, am, what amounts of power does the FBI have in foreign countries and uh, how can we uh, export our uh, well, when we have legislation that empowers the FBI to make arrests in foreign countries, how do we actually do that? It's addressed to you, Mr. Watson, but anybody sure. else? The FBI has no arrest authorities outside the United States. If we pick someone up, uh, unless it's an extraterritorial uh, arrest that's approved by the uh, president himself, uh, we have to work with the local law enforcement agencies of that country. It would be the reverse, all you have to do is think about the reverse. If a French DST officer or a French policeman from Paris comes to Grand Rapids to arrest a citizen in Grand Rapids, that's something the United States government and the chief of police and probably the uh, <laughs> head of the Michigan Patrol here would not allow, and we don't allow that. So what we do overseas is work with closely, not covertly, uh, but work with our law enforcement people and law enforcement matters. And we also work closely in the embassies with the uh, CIA and the chief of station who does things covertly, obviously. So the answer to that is just because we're the FBI and just because there's a suspect in some country doesn't give us the authority, arrest authorities overseas. Thanks. Uh, for uh, Judge Webster and for Representative Hoekstra, uh, the National Security Act um, that was recently amended talks about uh, acts against the United States and other crimes, the questioner asked. Is this ambiguous? And uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, does this mean that uh, our civil liberties are threatened? 
turn that over to the congressman. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was great. It's starting with the judge. <laughs> the, uh, um, Steve and I will listen. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, it, it, it may be ambiguous. I, I'm not, you know, the, uh, I think when we were talking about the FISA and the changing of, of the words that, it, that have just happened, um, you know, uh, my background is, is not the legal area, so I don't know whether those words or the words that are in the NSA Act uh, from a legal standpoint are ambiguous or not. And I would just really reinforce, uh, you know, what Dale and I think we've all said is that uh, there is not an intent to erode civil liberties. And uh, the, uh, the only way that that will happen uh, would be if there were a significant dialogue which would include the public and it might have to actually go through some type of a constitutional amendment. Uh, the intent is not to uh, erode civil liberties. Well, Judge, I have a question uh, regarding uh, President Clinton's administration. Um, the questioner asks, is it true that uh, President Clinton met infrequently with the CIA director? Well, I suppose that's true in the sense that uh, he did not uh, demonstrate the first order of business each morning that uh, the two Bush uh, presidents uh, did, uh, and in a little different style, President Reagan. Uh, there was a story that uh, at the time uh, of an airplane uh, crashing into the White House, if you remember that, uh, which raised a, I was on the Security Commission that reviewed that, but uh, uh, Jim Woolsey, the then uh, Director of Central Intelligence, let it be known that that was Woolsey trying to get an appointment with the president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's probably not fair to President Clinton, but his priority. I think it's fair to Jim either, Judge. <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, from a student uh, that uh, uh, this I'd like to just twist a bit because I know that you've all entered public service and it's for everyone. The question is, uh, is your job fun? <laughs> Can I amend it a bit and say, uh, you're driven to public service. Why? Why did you choose this route uh, quickly? And Colonel, can I start? Public service is a great reward. Uh, is it fun? There are days when it is more than enjoyable. There are more times when it is challenging. You put it all in perspective and understand the fact that there are missions to accomplish, things to do, for, in my case, the protection of society and administration of a, of a large department in our state. But it is tremendously rewarding. Would I have chosen another career? Absolutely not. I, I wanted to be a Michigan State Trooper from the time I could recognize what they were. Uh, for me to be sitting in this chair is more than a dream come true. Uh, it is really a, sort of a calling of sense. And uh, there are days when you uh, are up all night, the phone's ringing. I'm, I'm wired up with more microwave devices when I leave the house, <laughs> and I'll lose 10 pounds when I retire just to get rid of the pagers and the phone. But you do it for the good of society, and that sounds very gallant, and uh, uh, we have distinguished, much more distinguished members on this panel that have given their entire lives to public safety, and it's an honor to be in their presence. Thank you so much. Thanks, Colonel. Representative Hoekstra. Well, I think, uh, you know, I spent 15 years in the private sector before I got involved in, in public service, and you do it because you want to make a difference. Uh, I think it's a great question for a student to ask. At, at Herman Miller, we always said that, you know, if we weren't having fun, we weren't doing our job. Uh, and I think it's the same thing for public service. But then you have to come back and define what fun is. Okay. And 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 for for me, this job is, uh, uh, you know, you can have an impact. You can make a difference. So you're, you're actually doing something that is meaningful. Uh, it is a tremendous learning experience. I mean, the opportunity for you know, for the furniture guy from West Michigan to be sitting across the table uh, with, uh, with Yasser Arafat. You know, it's like, whoa, wait, America's a great place. And, you know, and, and besides that, I'm an immigrant. Where else in the world, you know, can you come and, uh, and have those types of experiences and, and, it, and, and be expected to contribute? So it's a tremendous uh, uh, learning experience uh, for me. So the, the opportunity to go in and uh, and make a difference uh, and to learn something and to be, uh, you know, like Steve was talking about, uh, to be challenged each and every day. Uh, that each and every day, each and every morning you wake up and there's, there, there's a new challenge. And that uh, uh, contrary to what, uh, what some folks uh, say, I think uh, 
uh, I have just been thoroughly impressed with, with the people that I've, I've encountered in public service. Uh, they're, you know, you know, the bureaucrats get, you know, they, they get, you know, they get dissed all the time. And uh, I have just found that uh, being in public service, I, I've had the opportunity to meet some some very talented people, uh, people that I can learn from each and every day. We don't always necessarily agree, uh, but that's part of the uh, the beauty of public service that that, that constant uh, tension that uh, you know that, that 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 tension that brings out the best in people and and drives people to new levels. So I, I uh, there, there's all kinds of things, and if a student is thinking about getting involved in public service, uh, it uh, I would strongly encourage them at, at some point to, uh, to consider it, uh, and it can, be, uh, it can be a very rewarding uh, and fun job. Thanks, Colonel Sandra. Dan. Uh, real quickly, most of the points have been made already. I, I looked at it as uh, my government service, graduated from college right into the U.S. Army, right into the FBI. And I came to a conscious decision early on that I wanted to, uh, one, whenever I retired, to be able to look in the mirror and say I made some type of difference. I could have made a lot more money doing a lot of different things. It's not about money. It's about dedication of, of individuals and government employees. Uh, I can look back on my career in the FBI, and I can tell everyone this in, in good conscience, that there wasn't a day that I didn't look forward to going to work. And there were some days that I looked more forward to than others. <laughs> and uh, even before, even after 9-11, with all the finger pointing, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you follow up on this? I mean, and all, all the 2020 hindsight. I can say, though, that public service is a great, great thing for this country. And you have tremendous hardworking men and women, not only in the FBI, but in the federal civil service. And, and I'm glad the congressman, and even at state and local levels, that have sold out to a cause to make this a better place. And there's nothing more honorable than doing that. Judge, I know we got a chance to talk about this <coughs> yesterday, but. Well, I'd, I'd like to, to say to the students who are here this morning, and I was always, I was very proud when Tom Brokaw wrote his book called The Greatest Generation, talking about my generation. And the essence of that book was we responded to the call of duty. Uh, whenever our country needed us, whether it was in war or in some other act of responsibility, we were ready to respond. And I hope this generation will also. Having fun, I don't know. The, when, I received, <laughs> when, I left, uh, when I left government, uh, the president presented me in a surprise ceremony with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And the only thing I could say really came from the heart. I said, I always thought that the satisfaction was in the doing, not in the recognition. The opportunities that come to you There'll be many in your own community and in your state, as well as perhaps some national assignment. And that is to be the private person in public life. You don't necessarily have to have been elected to office. You don't necessarily have to have a permanent government job. But there are many opportunities when you'll be asked to serve on task forces, on commissions, on particular jobs, uh, to weigh in on issues. And you can still be that private person and still be in public life. Maybe you have to take a sabbatical from your private life to go off and do a job. And you can always come back and resume your private experience. But nothing will be more satisfying in your whole life than feeling that you responded to duty when duty called. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, it's about time to bring our panel to an end. I would like to go to two things you said, Judge. Uh, one with President Bush's response to go to the National Cathedral and pray. What goes through my mind as I look at, at our children and the children of our, our enemies, the children of those who are undecided, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the three great faiths of Abraham could sit and pray together and maybe we could draw something toward moderation rather than let extremists define. The other is you mentioned Pearl Harbor and would we respond? Uh, at the Honolulu Police Department recently and taking the trip out to the Arizona, looking down in the water and seeing the oil still coming up from the bombing uh, and making a promise to those uh, young boys who are entombed in there. It's, uh, we have to keep this in mind. We can't let you down. So thank you very much for those images, Judge, and thank you all for being here. I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Alan Beckel, <laughs> this is the trial. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Marty. Uh, it just seems so appropriate to conclude with those kind of remarks because uh, this place is dedicated to a man who uh, 
gave his total life to public service. And I think it uh, makes me feel good to look at this group of people, whether it's a state policeman, a congressman, an FBI agent, a leader in so many dimensions, and a college professor who has given his time to help other agencies out, to know that there are people who are making this commitment to public service. I think sometimes we don't give them enough credit for what they do. So we're very fortunate to have them in this place dedicated to President Ford. On behalf of uh, the Hollenstein Center, Grand Valley State University, on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford Museum and Foundation, I'll make one little commercial pitch. If you like what you saw, you're not a friend of Ford, and there's a lot of friends of Ford here, you can join that organization, and it will support both Hollenstein Center and ourselves to do more of this. But my parting message to you is to have a very happy holiday season, and thank you very much for being here. Thank all of you. Thank you.